Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening from wherever you are around the world. Welcome to another webinar, wellness webinar on our Sunday. I'm Amy Leitman. I'll be your moderator for our wellness webinar today. Today, we're very pleased to welcome back Michelle McDonald for the nutritional management of GERD. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Michelle. Michelle McDonald is a clinical dietitian and certified diabetes educator at National Jewish Health. She provides compassionate, comprehensive nutritional care to adult patients with various chronic conditions, including bronchiectasis, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, gastrointestinal disease, interstitial lung disease, non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease, obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and type 2 diabetes. Michelle works closely with multidisciplinary teams of specialty clinics, including both inpatients and outpatients. She's dedicated to helping patients use nutrition as a supportive therapy to manage disease and optimize health. Michelle completed a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition at Cornell University, a Master of Science in Food Science and Human Nutrition at Colorado State University, and a dietic, dietetic internship at the University of Northern Colorado. So today you can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box and then hitting send. At the end of the, of the uh, presentation, I will read out the questions for the presenter to answer. And don't forget to join us for our upcoming presentations next Sunday, How to Live Life to the Fullest with NTM and Other Chronic Lung Disease with Dr. Devin Smith at 1 p.m. Eastern. And on Tuesday, October 26th, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Valentina Garini and Dr. Ross Klingberg, who will present on their research into novel approaches for the discovery of treatment monitoring biomarkers in NTM lung disease. We'd like to thank InsMed for supporting the work that we've done this year. We're very excited to be able to bring all this programming to you, and we can't do it without the support of companies like InsMed. Don't forget to find us on social media. You can also learn more and sign up for our email newsletter at ntminfo.org. Michelle, welcome back. Thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate this. We've really enjoyed your webinar series. We're excited to hear what you have to say today. So today's topic is nutrition and GERD. And um, I was able to listen to Dr. Hewitt's talk uh, on the 24th of September. She gave a hugely comprehensive talk on medical management and she included a lot of nutrition information. I work closely with Dr. Hewitt and other providers at National Jewish Health. So um, I'm going to try and help reinforce as well as review, maybe help clarify some of the things that were presented and maybe present some more information additionally. I will say, I do think this topic is a hard topic. Um, a lot, along with a lot of other medical topics, so I am continually learning and I hope that maybe this discussion can help bring you some clarity. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss anything that comes up at the end as a question because I think it's a topic that generates a lot of questions and concerns. Okay, so to get started, I have a lot of things in terms of the overview, but each section is pretty short. I, I kind of wanted to present my how I think of this. <laughs> so we're gonna start with a spotlight on reflux because I see reflux and GERD, I see them as, as just, um, there's a lot of overlap obviously, but I, I wanna make sure there's, a, I convey the distinction that I understand. Then we'll look specifically at what is GERD. We'll go back to reflux to really identify why it's a problem and what we can to do lifestyle wise to reduce it. And then we'll look specifically at what to drink, what not to drink in terms of beverages and what to eat and what not to eat. And these are these form the nutrition recommendations for reflux. And we'll end with how to live with reflux precautions. And this really is about how to moderate uh, or it, is there a possibility of moderating? Because a lot of times reflux precautions conflict with other goals like weight gain. <laughs> or enjoying life <laughs> um, or just habits that you already have. So a lot of times people have questions and um, concerns about reflux precautions. So let's get started. 
In terms of the spotlight on reflux, I'm just gonna run through um, some information on reflux that I think will help clarify the discussion and hopefully help you understand what's going on potentially with you. So very simply, reflux means something is backflowing, it's backing up. Um, want to keep it real simple. So in general, that's what reflux means in this uh, context. I recognize at least a few different types that are significant for our patients with lung disease. So gastroesophageal reflux is when fluid or food from your stomach backflows or refluxes through or up your esophagus, which is your feeding tube. Um, it's essentially backflow from your stomach, from the gastric region. That can be distinguished from esophagoesophageal reflux, I think I said that right, which you may not have heard of, but it's important to understand that you can have reflux from your esophagus. For instance, if you have trouble swallowing, um, maybe you have a stricture in your esophagus or you have maybe poor motility, um, this is my understanding in any case. And if you eat uh, something or drink something or a combination and it doesn't go all the way down the esophagus and it tends to backflow uh, back up, like it doesn't make it all the way down to the stomach, for instance, then you have reflux or backflow from your esophagus. Then there's another term that Dr. Hewitt brought up. So I thought I would try and bring it up again. It, uh, it's laryngopharyngeal reflux or LPR. Uh, this is backflow of stomach contents into the mouth, the throat, otherwise known as the pharynx, and hence part of the term, voice box or larynx, again, hence part of the term, and windpipe trachea. So basically what we're saying is that you've had material that was either in your stomach or your esophagus um, breach your upper esophageal sphincter muscle. And now it's, it's in your oral cavity. And um, it's essentially backflow of contents um, higher up. <laughs> and Dr. Hewitt made the distinction that gastroesophageal reflux occurs down near your lower esophageal sphincter, um, which is you know near the, at the end of the esophagus, farther away from your mouth and closer to your stomach whereas laryngopharyngeal reflux tends to happen above the upper esophageal sphincter muscle. This is again, my understanding. And then, and both gastroesophageal reflux and esophagoesophageal reflux can contribute or cause laryngopharyngeal reflux because that's, because that's where it's coming from. It's coming from the stomach or the esophagus and ending up in your oral cavity where then it's at risk for entering your lungs or disturbing your voice box or potentially even affecting your sinuses. So these concepts were actually confusing to me and to some degree I, I still find them hard because they're used in different contexts, but I hope this helps a little bit. So here are some other notables. Um, it is my understanding that all people, everybody is affected by gastroesophageal reflux. Again, that's uh, contents come from your stomach. This happens in everybody um, intermittently and it happens both day and night. And I think it may even be true that for, uh, for most people it happens more during the day because we're active and we're putting a lot of pressure on that lower esophageal sphincter muscle, that internal muscle at the end of your esophagus that's supposed to shut and keep things in your stomach, but that will transiently open, especially if you're putting pressure there just by being active during the day, or in particular, if you are bending over um, and or lying back and, you have, and might have maybe extra weight, for instance, putting pressure in that area. Um, but it's, it's something that I believe is recognized to happen to everybody intermittently throughout the day. So it's, it, it, ha it, it happens <laughs> to everybody. It's just more problematic in people who have vulnerable lungs. So other terminology that you may hear is that reflux may be silent. That means you don't have symptoms, you're asymptomatic. Um, and some people ask, like, well, how, how can I not? 
feel it. It's a little hard to understand. And to be honest, I don't know the exact answer other than I think it's possible that some people have lost the sensitivity um, to feel it, or maybe there are some other mechanisms, but it is true that you may have reflux and be completely asymptomatic. And that refers uh, particularly to gastroesophageal reflux. Um, I think it's possible that that also uh, applies to the other, um, other reflux, particularly LPR. I think you can also be asymptomatic there, although I think throat symptoms are more common with LPR. In terms of other concepts that I think are important, reflux can be both acidic and non-acidic. Um, and both of those things can be problematic. Um, so in that, that which is uh, to some degree a segue into the, another concept, which is that medications like proton pump inhibitors um, or antacids may reduce the acidity of reflux. And there are some medications that may reduce the frequency of reflux as well as surgery may uh, reduce the frequency of it. But the key point is that there is no medication that will stop it 100% of the time. So just because you may be taking a medication doesn't mean that you don't have it. In fact, um, it, it's widely, well, I would say we, we tend to think that most people have it intermittently, um, both during the day and the night, and therefore there's a risk. And if medications can't stop it, then diet and lifestyle modifications can be extremely helpful in, in reducing the risk. There is good evidence that some diet and lifestyle precautions really do um, minimize reflux. So we'll go through those. But these key concepts I think are important to get and I, I, I think they're hard. I, th I think it's hard, I think this is a hard topic. So let's keep going then. Now we're into our second um, piece, which is what is GERD? Um, and it is an acronym for gastroesophageal reflux disease. So now we have a disease component to this. So what does that mean? It means that we have stomach contents, fluid or food. And I'll mention that Dr. Hewitt really focused on fluids being more problematic because they can slosh. Um, but technically the definition is any kind of contents, fluid or food back flowing into the esophagus or feeding tube or beyond, such as the mouth area or the lung. And then the disease piece comes in in terms of if that gastroesophageal reflux is causing symptoms like heartburn or regurgitation or problems such as lung infections or others. So the disease element comes in in terms of when there is a pathology or when there are complications as a result of the gastroesophageal reflux. Okay, what to next? So let's, uh, let's go back to reflux. Um, and hopefully this isn't confusing, but essentially reflux in general of fluid or food, again, and that can be coming from the stomach or the esophagus, may breach the up uh, your upper esophageal sphincter muscle. You have two of them, one at the top of your esophagus and one at the bottom. And when this happens, then those fluids in particular can enter the lungs. And this is what we call aspiration. And it's possible that that process of reflux entering uh, the lungs is either causing or contributing to lung infections and inflammation for both bronchiectasis and NTM patients. So this is the risk. And this is why um, we see this as an issue to manage. And if this is happening, to hopefully clarify, um, I believe we would say you're having complications and therefore you likely have GERD. Okay, so some lifestyle things that, that have been shown to reduce reflux um, the top three, I know there's good evidence in the literature for those. The bottom three kind of stand to reason that they would also make sense. And then the last one deals with food. And um, I would say there's, there's reasonable evidence regarding food. So for the top three, these are lifestyle things that we know really do make a difference. 
The first is elevating the head of bed by 30 degrees or more. And Dr. Hewitt really made a point that from your hips to your shoulders, that whole area, like your torso has to be elevated by at least 30 degrees. And that's hard to do with a wedge. It's really achievable when you have an adjustable bed and you adjust it and you use your adjustable bed. Um, or if you sleep in, in a recliner and you're, again, you're upright. So that is well known to reduce reflux events, to actually reduce how many times you have uh, the movement of fluid or food um, from your stomach to come up. Um, stopping fluids, beverages, and foods, eating foods within two to three hours of bedtime also seems to be very helpful. And I should add, in terms of elevating the head of your bed, I think that that's maybe self-evident in terms of why that's helpful because you're, you're, you're positioning your body in such a way that gravity is going to make it very hard for contents of your stomach to go back up, especially if you're not being super active in your, um, at night when you're sleeping. In terms of the second one, um, not drinking fluid or eating food within two to three hours of bedtime. Again, this may be self-evident in terms of why this may reduce reflux and essentially you're, you, we are trying to empty our stomach before we're reclining at all. So that there's, there, while there may be some gastric juices left there, we're not adding on top of that or layering on top of that. Sleeping on your back or left side are also is also preferable because in those positions, the contents of your stomach, whatever is in there, hopefully less since you haven't been drinking fluid or eating food uh, within two, three hours of bedtime, but whatever is left in your stomach has a very hard time of exiting when you're on your back or left side because the contents don't have access to your <clears throat> esophagus <clears throat> in those positions. The right-hand side is not recommended because uh, food or fluid contents of your stomach easily pass out of the stomach and into your esophagus where they can then travel um, forward essentially or back toward your, your throat, mouth area and trachea, windpipe. Okay, so those are pretty solid. Um, and I often talk to people about using lifestyle recommendations in order to mitigate any effects of potential food triggers, because not everyone is perfect with your food triggers at all times. So then in terms of the next three recommendations, limiting fluids is something that stands to reason as to why it would make sense, because if you're putting too much in your stomach, particularly something that has movement like fluid, then it's more likely to splash or slosh or backflow. So at National Jewish, I generally recommend and we generally recommend to limit fluids to about six fluid ounces per hour during the day. This is like essentially if you're concerned about getting enough, uh, getting hydrated enough or getting enough fluid, or talking about is spreading out your fluid so that you can get Say if you were to be awake for eight hours, that's 48 ounces. Um, 48 ounces is, if I can do the math here, um, it's one and a half liters. That is plenty of fluid to help you hydrate. Um, I also agree with Dr. Hewitt in that we don't need eight cups which are eight ounces of fluid or water per day. That's likely more than all of us really need, or most of us need. Um, then we also recommend that you drink those fluids with grains and starchy foods so that it kind of anchors the fluid in the food and in the stomach so that it has, so that's less volatile or less, it's not gonna move as much. In terms of other things that make sense, eating small frequent meals makes sense, avoid overeating. And, and the reason is essentially we're just not exceeding the capacity of our stomach. If you overfill something, um, a pouch like your stomach, it, it's gonna come out and it could potentially come back up. And I think, I certainly know what that's like. If you eat too much, you can feel it coming back up. Sometimes you have a sense of regurgitation. Staying upright, I think also is a very sensible recommendation because again, you're trying to use gravity to keep food and fluid down. And um, 
also when you stay upright, you're not putting pressure on the abdominal region. So I even talk to people about bending at their knees <laughs> rather than their waist in order if you, and trying not to be inverted. Um, it's super important, we think, to stay upright, especially if you have eaten a large meal or eaten any trigger foods during the day, it's just more protective. And then lastly, there are foods um, that may be irritants or what I call trigger foods, foods that seem to cause reflux. And there's a number of mechanisms by which foods can cause reflux. One of which is that some foods have demonstrated that they can weaken the lower esophageal sphincter muscle um, based on their own properties. Um, some foods may increase acid production and just increase the fluid volume in your stomach. So that's kind of a may, um, but that's also a thought. And some foods also increase the pressure in your system. What comes to mind there is carbonated beverages, which can also then weaken the, potentially weaken the lower esophageal sphincter. And some foods just make your digestion happen really slowly. Those are high fat foods. And so we'll see those coming up, but there are specific reasons, um, mechanisms um, for, behind why foods, certain foods are triggers. And there is research that seems to support that, especially for the foods that uh, loosen or weaken the lower esophageal sphincter. <clears throat> okay. So on to the food piece, in terms of what to drink, um, I tried to make this list as long as possible, although you might, some people might just automatically reject the first one, which is caffeine-free coffee substitutes. So those do exist. <laughs> I don't know very many people that use them. I have, had, I have had a small handful of patients tell me that they really like them. Um, just know that they exist. Um, what we're going for here is caffeine-free. So caffeine-free herbal teas are also thumbs up uh, because they're essentially herbal infusions. Um, they don't contain any real tea. Uh, Low-fat milks are on the, on the recommended list and low-fat is there because higher-fat foods tend to slow digestion. And this could be animal or uh, plant-based milks. And there's a lot of plant-based milks on the market now that a lot of the people I see, sometimes it seems like most of the people I see are, are off dairy for one reason or another. So almond milk, um, just dairy or cow's milk, oat, soy, there's a lot of other plant-based milks that would be completely fine. In terms of juice, uh, we'd recommend a non-citrus juice and there, there are more non-citrus juices other than just apple and grape. So you can get, you can get more sophisticated or fancy if, if you will with something like blueberry or cherry or raspberry, or there's mango, you can buy nectars like apricot or peach nectars. Those are actually quite nice. Um, pomegranate juice, uh, that season is coming up among others. And then of course, there's always water. Um, plain, preferably, um, not bubbly. If, if you wanna do flavored water, again, not bubbly, not citrus. And there's infused waters. So people will put cucumber and raspberries in their water or strawberries. Um, something like that. So I'm trying to make this seem like you have a lot of options. There, there really aren't that many there, um, but this is what would be preferred to drink with reflux. In terms of what not to drink, this is a longer list. So alcohol and anything with caffeine, including decaffeinated coffee and tea, because there is a small degree of caffeine in there. Um, we know those two beverages I would say, I, I would probably say alcohol is the, maybe the most potent trigger um, in terms of weakening that lower esophageal sphincter muscle. Anything with caffeine, however, coffee and tea and other energy drinks, which are down below as well as potentially sodas also make the list. So those are probably among the triggers, some of the stronger ones. Carbonated beverages, I would argue, are also um, relatively strong promoters of reflux because of the, um, the bubbles in the water that, or, and, or the beverage that are actually providing some upward pressure or in the pressure in the wrong direction. Um, so those are also among the more, uh, any carbonated beverages, beer, bubbly water, which is like sparkling water or flavored or unflavored. 
um, champagne soda. Those top three are, and even the chocolate, I would even argue is another strong trigger because of its effect on the lower esophageal sphincter. So any beverage that's chocolate flavored or mint flavored would also be on the not to drink list. Citrus juices, um, including grapefruit, lemon, lime, orange, pineapple, and then the, the tomato is pretty acidic. So that's always sad. A lot of people drink orange juice um, for, or even grapefruit juice for breakfast. So that should be reconsidered. Energy drinks I mentioned, um, typically those are caffeinated and carbonated. Sodas, same issue, caffeinated and carbonated. And then vinegar, I put that on here because vinegar is sometimes um, spoke about online and in different circles as a healthy beverage. Um, and unfortunately it is relatively acidic. And I should mention vinegar in alternative circles is also discussed as uh, a beverage that um, is supposed to help reduce reflux. We teach that that's, we don't teach that. <laughs> we teach that vinegar is an acidic um, substance that may promote reflux. So we discourage drinking straight vinegar. Um, and just as a side note, you'll see this vinegar on the list of foods to avoid. I, of course, am always trying to find a way to moderate if that's possible. And also with the permission of your uh, doctor, for instance, too. But you know, when you mix vinegar and oil, when you cut it in oil, um, it's not always super acidic and you're not always using that much of it. So I'm usually okay with people doing a vinaigrette as long as there's more oil than vinegar. That was a little bit of a side note, but because I'm always just, I, I hate telling people what they can't do, especially when the list is long and includes a lot of things that we like. Okay, so then what you can, so that, that does beverages. In terms of what to eat, I, so when I, when I look at this list, I, I generally think that most healthful foods are on the list of what you can eat. So lean proteins generally are not offensive. It's the higher fat um, meats, particularly processed meats or uh, the skin on chicken or fish or meats that we, meet, we might wanna avoid. But I did, I did use the adjective lean because what we're going for is lower in fat. But essentially most proteins, and I, I include nuts on the okay list, even though they are relatively high in fat, um, I don't think the evidence is strong enough to put them on the avoid list. And I think they're relatively healthy and can be used as a tool to uh, maintain a healthy weight. So I'm thumbs up on nuts and seeds. In terms of grains, um, we know these are good for, for a well-balanced diet and often to help maintain a healthy weight. And in the case of reflux, to really help absorb any fluid that's in the food or any beverages and fluids that you may be drinking. So oatmeal, rice, whole wheat, but this can go on in terms of um, anything that's made with a flour. Um, so any kind of bread or a grain. Um, and I guess I was thinking of, I was thinking of uh, breads or pancakes or muffins or something like that. Um, there are a lot of fruits that are recommended because they're non-citrus. Um, apples, bananas, berries, melons, peaches, pears, um, I mean, we could go to grapes. Well, there are a lot of fruits that can be part of the list. Um, and again, as I think as moderation is on my mind in terms of some of the citrus fruits, you could potentially do those in smaller quantities earlier in the day, but try and get more variety in your fruit if you're just so used to doing that orange juice in the morning. In terms of vegetables, um, most vegetables, with the exception of really hot peppers or spicy uh, peppers, are on the list. So I just named some, but bell peppers, broccoli, carrots, cucumbers, mushrooms, um, onions are even okay, and garlic, unless they are your own personal tr trigger foods, and all of your greens and squashes. In terms of herbs and spices, you have kind of, you also have a big list there. It's the 
hot peppers that we're trying to avoid and excessive black pepper, anything that would be too spicy, we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to moderate the spice level and keep it more mild to moderate. Again, trying to make this seem rich here in terms of what not to eat. I put this in alphabetical order because I do those things. Uh, chocolates at the top um, in terms of it weakening our lower esophageal sphincter muscle. Fatty foods are here and I just named some, but um, processed meats can be high in fat. Dairy in terms of whole milk or cheese or ice cream um, can be high in fat. Probably the biggest culprit here in terms of fatty foods are fried foods. So anything that is deep fried just contains so much oil because it just oil absorbs into the batter of anything that's fried. Um, and it, 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 oil is dense. <laughs> There's a lot of calories in it. It's really greasy. And that is probably the, one of the biggest culprits in terms of when people talk to me and tell me what foods are problematic. I hear a lot about fried foods. I hear a lot about spicy foods, which are also on this list. I hear a lot about alcohol. I hear a lot about caffeine. <clears throat> but sweets are also here just because if you're eating a large amount of them, usually sweets are high in fat um, as well as sugar. It just, they're very caloric. And so if you're eating a lot of donuts, for instance, or I, so a lot of something that's sweet that's high in fat, then that might be problematic. Hot peppers I mentioned, ketchup and mustard, because in ketchup's case, we've got the you know, tomato and vinegar. With mustard, you've got the vinegar and maybe some spice. Mint flavored anything, candy, gum, tea. A lot of people chew mint gum. A lot of people do mints. A lot of people do mint herbal tea. That's one of the herbal teas that we would not recommend. Anything like peppermint or spearmint or a mixed mint would be on the limit or avoid list. Spicy foods I mentioned, tomatoes and tomato sauce. And this, is, this always <laughs> trips people up Tomato sauce is probably the worst culprit because it's more concentrated so that tomato paste is really acidic and strong, excuse me. Uh, fresh tomatoes, especially if you stew them or boil them, some of the acids are going to volatilize or cook off. So um, you'll end up with a sweeter, less acidic, less concentrated, less potent food. So I'm probably more lenient with fresh tomatoes than I am with something that's like tomato sauce, like on a pizza or a lasagna or a spaghetti, for instance. And then vinegar is on the list here too. Uh, but again, I'm okay with an oil, with a vinaigrette, especially if you're making it with like two or three parts of oil to one part vinaigrette, which is the typical. Okay. So then we're gonna to move to the last part of the presentation and hopefully leave a decent amount of time with questions. But this is essentially how to live with these precautions, both lifestyle and diet. And I would always start number one with, if you're concerned about how to follow um, reflux precautions and you want to know if you can modify them and not to use the term cheat, but that's what I'm thinking, if you want to flex some of the recommendations, I would always discuss that with your provider, especially if the provider is recommending reflux precautions, um, because I think it's appropriate to consider your case on an individual basis. So what comes to my mind is, you know, if I see a patient who is in a more severe has a more severe or dire presentation. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of someone, for instance, who has one lung. <clears throat> they have one good lung left. For whatever reason, the other one had to be removed, whether it was cancer or, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, or uh, a lung surgery related to infections. For some reason, they really only have one lung left, and that lung has disease in it. So we're very concerned about protecting that lung, and this person is very sick. And if, if this person presents to me and they, um, especially if they are already at a relatively healthy weight and they're frustrated with their reflux precautions, 
I'm going, I'm going to sit and think, well, they should discuss this with their doctor, but they look to me like someone who we need to be very careful about protecting the lung that they have left. We need, we need to do everything we need to possibly do to protect that. So I want to be more strict with reflux precautions as long as I'm not jeopardizing their nutritional status and their, and their healthy weight. Um, because we know that reflux, which can lead to aspiration, could potentially really harm the lung they have left. So what I'm trying to say is in people who have more severe disease and maybe are not as well managed despite being compliant with a lot of therapies that are supposed to help their lungs, we might need to take the diet and lifestyle precautions for reflux more seriously because that's what we have in terms of another therapeutic approach. And um, I may be more tempted to be more strict. On the other hand, if you have someone, so sorry, let me, let me put someone else in there. If you have someone who, um, you know, we often see people who come to National Jewish and they, it seems as though reflux may be one of their main problems. In other words, that is what's causing the soiling of the lungs and this kind of intermittent um, colonization with the microbacteria. And if we think we can quote unquote um, prevent or not treat and kind of manage the case or maybe even, I hate to use the word cure, but really manage the disease well with reflux precautions only, and maybe it's worth a really a good, like a really, um, I want to say college try, but maybe it's worth a really strict approach to see if that can really take care of you without the need for medication. Now, you still might need respiratory therapy, but again, everyone's different. And so if, if um, the doctors are seriously thinking, if you can manage reflux and do good airway clearance and you're going to be good with those things, then why not give that a try and see if it works? Um, on the other hand, if you're someone who has maybe more mild disease, your weight's healthy, um, and you kind of want to enjoy a little something every now and then, I'm going to look for ways to work with you to try and get you to enjoy some of the triggers, but be as safe as possible. And, and we'll, we'll work with all the different precautions so that if you're going to be weak on some of the foods that you are going to have that alcohol at night, then we're going to strengthen some of the other recommendations, say sleeping in your recliner or making sure you get yourself upright at night to that 30 degrees or more in order to mitigate the effect of the insult or offense. So I think you really have to look at yourself and speak with your provider and work on an individual basis. What works for someone else may not be necessarily appropriate for you. Okay, so my advice, given that I'm not the doctor, and I will usually say you should always, you know, if you have concerns, talk to the doctor. But what I tell people, what I feel comfortable telling people with is, if you have personal trigger foods, which means if you eat foods or drink certain fluids and you are symptomatic, you have heartburn, you have regurgitation, you're coughing, um, uh, you have other symptoms that are problematic for you and you consistently notice that they occur when you enjoy a certain food or fluid, then I think it's appropriate to avoid or limiting those foods. Those are your own personal trigger foods. And again, those for you may be different than for somebody else. But if you're symptomatic with something, then you've demonstrated to yourself that you have a problem with those particular things. And I mean, I know for me, when I eat too much, <laughs> that's problematic. So in terms of volume, may also be an issue. And that's both with fluid and food. Okay. Thirdly, I always try and prioritize. Again, if someone is trying to modify uh, the precautions or they want to know if they can kind of flex them a little bit, um, I have the discussion that it may be, it may be appropriate to really pay more attention to avoiding foods that um, we know are more potent triggers um, and they have the mechanism of weakening your lower esophageal sphincter muscle because that's particularly problematic. So alcohol, sorry, is top of the list. Caffeine, carbonated beverages, chocolate. So, um, you know, I, if, you know, if someone's like, I need my orange at breakfast <laughs> or my grapefruit, um, I may be 
more willing to allow a small, small portion of that trigger, but really focus on the fact that they're drinking too much alcohol really late at night on a regular basis and see if we can negotiate that before we um, f uh, get too strict on the small amount of citrus fruit. Um, so you can kind of prioritize and try and pick a modification that will have the biggest impact if, even if you're not perfect with every single precaution. And then lastly, if you choose to eat or enjoy a trigger fluid or food, there are ways that you can um, minimize the damage. <laughs> you can, for instance, eat or drink a small portion of whatever the trigger food is. You can do that earlier in the day. You can stay upright after eating or drinking. You can try and enjoy just one insult at a time so you're not compounding the effect. You can make sure if you're doing um, eating or enjoying the trigger food later in the evening, you're sleeping with your head of bed elevated so your upper body is elevated to 30 degrees or more. So there are ways to incorporate some of the foods that are trigger foods, especially if um, you need to gain weight. And this is where I tend to flex more than um, elsewhere um, because sometimes weight gain um, or maintaining a healthy weight or restoring your weight or muscle mass is really priority. And some of the higher fat foods, for instance, become acceptable because I can usually, you know, I'll see someone who's, who needs to restore some weight and I know their portions aren't that big. So yes, of course it's okay to have the whole milk. I usually recommend that or the full fat dairy or the cheese, full fat cheese, for instance. Um, or the ice cream, because so um, again, I'm thinking in people who present more severely, it's hard for them to eat a large amount and they need to get as much as possible out of a small volume of food they're eating. And then of course, we'll try and mitigate those things by having people move their food earlier in the day, try and stop eating within two to three hours of bedtime. We try and work Essentially, we try and massage everything. So we're on balance, hopefully doing more benefit than harm. So I hope that's helpful. Um, that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. <laughs> um, now that I have my volume back. Uh, we have some questions in the queue. Let's get started. I have been avoiding drinking tap water due to my diagnosis of MAC. Is distilled water okay from a nutritional standpoint or am I missing important nutrients? Oh, that's an interesting question. All oh, these water questions. I need like, I need like a lifeline with like Dr. Falk. <laughs> we're, we're, going, we're going to be having a, a webinar with him later this year. So I will okay. be making note of these questions for him as well. Right, so let me, but let me think it, let me, let me attack this first. So distilled water, um, when you distill something, usually you bring it to a high temperature, so water in this case, and then um, certain things may precipitate out of it. I actually forget what comes out. Maybe I'm forgetting what, I actually don't know <laughs> distilled water is it may just lack some minerals that precipitate out. I mean, my, so from a nutritional standpoint, I would say, um, distilled water is probably okay because you don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily count on your water to be a huge nutritional source for your main minerals. Um, I would say you'd want to get those from food. That's what I'm going to say off the bat. What I'm questioning though is whether or not distilled water is actually helpful in terms of preventing your exposure to mycobacterial disease. And I, I think the answer may be no. Um, we know that boiling tap water, um, for five or 10 minutes or more, especially if you live at altitude, like um, we do here at National Jewish Health, um, may be the best approach to reducing the numbers of mycobacteria in water. Um, and if you're traveling, I think spring water is better because um, mycobacteria are found in uh, like the tap water sources that come through pipes. That's, they're coming from the biofilm, I believe on those pipes. So without being an expert in this area, I'm going to say um, distilled water is probably fine from a nutritional standpoint, but I don't know if it's the best approach in terms of reducing mycobacterial exposure. Okay, well, I made a note of that as well. So we'll follow up with Joe on that one as well. Yeah. 
do we have to eat something solid to sponge our liquids every time we drink six ounces of water? We would be eating all day. So, and do you have any suggestions as to what they should eat and maybe to the quantity they should eat? Yeah, and this is hard. So in general, I do think it makes sense to have uh, some kind of carbohydrate sponge because our carbohydrates or our starches <clears throat> are well known to absorb water um, and they will swell. And like oatmeal, for instance, when you boil oatmeal or think of rice, whenever you boil those things, they become gelatinous. The starch actually kind of leaches out partly into the water and it makes it thick. So the starches are going to help absorb the fluid and keep them uh, keep the fluid with the food anchored in your stomach and less likely to slosh. So I do, I think that's a reasonable, sensible recommendation. Um, and I know it's hard to just keep eating all day, although that's what I prefer to do, but as that's an aside. Um, but what I often recommend people do is if you don't wanna be um, eating all day, what, one thing to consider is to try and put your fluids around your meal times so that you kind of get your six ounces maybe in four during and after. And I know that's, I know that's about 18 ounces of fluid over, I don't know, two or three hour period. But if your meal contains a good amount of say at breakfast, you may have a decent bowl of oatmeal, which I would say is about a half a cup cooked, sorry, a half a cup dry and then cooked or if you can't do quite that much, at least a third of a cup dry that is then cooked, um, or two slices of uh, bread, or if you're gonna do something like potatoes at um, breakfast, I probably want something that was something like three quarters or a cup. We're talking about like a medium sized potato, maybe some, something starchy. If you're doing other cereals, um, and again, it to some degree depends on your needs in terms of what you should be eating, but you probably should be eating at least a cup or a cup and a half of some, some kind of cereal that's gonna give you some kind of starch. Um, but if you can, and that's just using breakfast, but if you can put your fluids around that meal, it's possible that the fluids will then, you know, your, your meal isn't going to digest all at once. So the fluids will kind of become part of that meal. That's one approach that I suggest. Um, if you are willing to snack once or twice a day, maybe just once if twice is too much, um, try and do some kind of, whether it's granola on yogurt to get that sponge effect or do like a muffin maybe with peanut butter <clears throat> or do crackers with something like crackers with an avocado or crackers with hummus or pita chips or something like that um, with whatever it is you're eating so that the fluid that you're drinking throughout the day can also be anchored. But then what I said for breakfast kind of applies to lunch and dinner. Try and always balance your meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and your snacks with some kind of grain or starch. Um, it could be crackers, it could be pretzels, it could be rice cakes, um, could be uh, toast, could be chips of some kind. And then it could also just be your standard grains. I do oatmeal for breakfast usually. I'll do, I will even do pasta or potatoes or rice um, or barley or quinoa or something that's going to absorb the fluid. Um, the amount of starch you eat, I think we're also trying to make it seem plausible that you eat enough starch that it can anchor the fluid that you're drinking. It, this is hard. I'm not, I'm not gonna like, it's not easy, but if you can spread out your fluids, then you won't be getting too excessive a volume of fluid at any one given meal or snack. So I think that might be the best I can do without knowing your specific situation. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a hiatal hernia. Is GERD or reflux inevitable? Wow, that's a good question. Um, so, so I'm not an expert. I, I think it's true that a hiatal hernia um, can increase the risk of it because you essentially don't have pressure around your lower esophageal sphincter. You don't have that external pressure reinforcing the internal muscle um, because you've got you know, this, this displacement um, of your stomach and the esophagus as a result. 
Um, I don't think it's inevitable though, because you do have some intrinsic, uh, uh, you still have intrinsic um, function of that lower esophageal sphincter muscle. So I, I think, and this is my opinion, but I would, I am not the expert that it is not inevitable, but it, you are at higher risk. Okay. How is reflux different from vomiting? Oh, <laughs> well, um, reflux doesn't have to lead, generally doesn't lead to vomiting. Um, vomiting is more, more forceful. Um, it's a more forceful reaction and expulsion of what's inside of you. So, um, yeah, I mean, vomiting can often be a side effect of a medication. Um, heck, I, I get seasick. That's, if that, that happens, I'll be vomiting. <laughs> so if I'm nauseated, that can cause like things to come out. Um, but reflux is simply the backflow uh, of content. So it's going in the wrong direction. It's generally not supposed to be going up or backflowing. It's supposed to be going forward and down through you. Okay. Is decaf coffee permitted on a caffeine-free diet for reflux prevention, or is there a small amount of caffeine in decaf coffee? There is a small amount of caffeine, and it depends on the decaf coffee. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess at my numbers. I should be more specific, but I think decaf coffee has like 15 or 20 milligrams of caffeine per cup, whereas a cup of coffee, I'm gonna stretch here. Is it 75, 80, 90 milligrams of caffeine? So there is considerably less. So in theory, the effect is less. I think that's reasonable, but calf, decaf is still considered um, not advisable on a caffeine-free diet because there is caffeine in it. <laughs> to be strict about it. We'd prefer um, using caffeine-free in other words. Okay. What is your opinion of mineral water? Is it on the not to drink list? And I guess that might also include like some uh, San Pellegrino water. Yeah, so I'm guessing that's the sparkly. Um, mm -hmm. Anything, what I mean by that is there's bubbles in it. There's natural gas uh, bubbles in it. So that's carbonation or that it's bubbles back. It's pressure in the water that when you drink it will then increase the pressure in your system and potentially increase the back pressure, which would potentially cause the movement of um, fluids in your stomach to go backward or reflux. And so it's carbonation is not recommended. It's one of the two things that I, not two, not two things, but one of the few things that I know the literature says may be problematic in terms of causing symptoms and causing reflux events. And then when you remove it from the diet, it seems to lessen the symptoms and lessen the reflux events. So we do think that one's problematic, unfortunately. Um, would a product like Goli, which uh, apparently is an apple cider vinegar gummy, be as harmful as the vinegar itself since it's in gummy form? Good question. I think it, um, <laughs> <laughs> My guess is what's in the gummy is probably, there's probably some uh, gum, <laughs> something to make it uh, thick. And then there's vinegar. So my guess is it's probably a little better because it's not as vinegary and it's not fluid. <laughs> um, but still probably wouldn't necessarily be my choice, um, um, but it might be better than the actual fluid. I'm just guessing here. Okay. Um May I drink water that I make with organic cranberry juice, unsweetened, and a little bit of apple cider, cider vinegar for, uh, with, the, this is with the mother, I'm not sure what that means, for my daily 48 ounces of liquid? Right. So what you're saying is you want to use some of the known irritants, but probably in smaller quantities, especially if you dilute it maybe in a little water. And um, I, I think... I want to say yes, it's okay, but I because I you know I want to support people doing what they believe is important for their health. But then maybe what I'd have you so hold on, let me back up. I'm just gonna uh, cons what I'm gonna say is uh, um, you're you're going you're accepting that you want to do some triggers. So if that's true, if you want to include that in your diet, 
then the, the, then the thing to do is to try and figure out how to be smart about it. Can you do a limited volume and try and stay within the volume recommendations? And can you maybe take that with um, some foods that are going to absorb it so that you're not going to have a sloshy stomach? And can you do it, um, can you preferably stay upright after you do that and do it um, earlier in the day so it's not close to bedtime? And would you make those kinds of same recommendations for something like lemon or lime juice? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, talk to your doctor. How, how important is it that you be very strict? You know, the citrus juices, um, including vinegar, are not necessarily one of the more potent ones to the best of my knowledge. <clears throat> so I may be more willing to be more lenient with those as long as it's okay with your provider. Okay. How do fatty foods aggravate GERD? So fatty foods, I mentioned this in particular, the really bad offenders are the fried foods, but anything that's high in fat tends to slow the movement of what it is you are eating or if you're drinking something high fat. Any, anything that you eat um, or intake that's high in fat is going to move more slowly through your stomach. It just slows down the digestive process. So it will be sitting around um, turning into a more uh, you know, fluid contents in your stomach and it will just be there longer and be more likely then to backflow because it's in the proximity of your lower esophageal sphincter and be able to uh, reflux or backflow back up. That's what that means. It's a slow, it's, a, it's the fact that fatty foods, slow digestion is the basis for that recommendation. Uh, what does mint do that makes it not good to consume? You know, so, and this is, I, as far as I know, I don't know the exact mechanisms, but I think mint may be in the category of foods that weaken the lower esophageal sphincter. I didn't, I don't think I mentioned that before, but I, but I've, but I've been told that by uh, some of the GI doctors I work with that it may be one of those foods. Additionally, it may be a food that may increase the acid secretion and therefore the volume of uh, fluid in your stomach when you digest it. Mint is a confusing one from the perspective of it's marketed as being good for your digestion. Um, and all I can say from a reflux perspective is that it, it may promote reflux because it may have a, an effect of weakening your lower esophageal sphincter muscle, and it may also um, affect the actual acid production in your stomach. Okay, um, you mentioned that mustard is bad. What about turmeric? Is that okay? Turmeric is okay. It's um, not a hot, spicy spice. It does have a little bit of heat, actually. I think I know where you're going with this, but it's not on the avoid list. Okay. Um, somebody writes, I have bronchiectasis and presumptive GERD, hiatal hernia and have been seen at National Jewish. I've never had reflux ep episodes. I've been following a low acid diet, no drugs, all restrictions for three years. Recently had a consultation at um, UCSD with the medical director for the Center for Esophageal Diseases and a specialist in GERD. They said GERD would not be helped by a low acid diet since the stomach is always acidic and I could resume eating all the acidic foods I've been avoiding. How can I know for sure whether it's safe to resume eating acidic foods? Oh gosh. Um, well, I guess I'd be curious to know what foods you are um, identifying as acidic um, because they're, well, <sighs> Yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly sure I understand what they meant. I, I still would think that, for instance, something like tomato sauce or a, a very concentrated tomato paste is something that they would want you to not keep in your diet in large amounts. Um, but there is a book that I, there's at least one book that I'm aware of that's fairly high profile that talks about um, eating a low acid diet. And it has a little bit of a different philosophy than what we're speaking about here. So I'm wondering if the advice you were given was in response to some of this alternative um, recommendations 
regarding low acid, but I'm not sure. So, so sorry, I think you're, tell me, remind me what the question was again. Uh, the question, um, so this person had written that um, they have bronchiectasis and presumptive GERD. Um, they've never had reflux episodes. They've been following a low acid diet for several years. They had recent consultation and they were told that GERD would not be helped by a low acid diet since the stomach's always acidic. And they started eating and they were told they could start eating all the acidic foods they've been avoiding. How can I know for sure whether it's safe to resume eating, eating acidic foods? Right. So, sorry, I think I would want to know exactly what foods they want to resume eating. Okay. Yeah, I would want more information on that. Okay. Um, somebody writes, I like to make soups in the winter, but many or perhaps most are either tomato or cream based. Suggestions would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, well, well, broth, <laughs> broth based soups, not, um, I, I hate to just say don't eat those, but you can go for something that's not going to be cream based and doesn't have a lot of tomato in it or um, other ways to, so I'm thinking of what ways to mitigate this. You can do, you could try a lower fat, you know, uh, cream based soup, which means maybe you use a little bit less cream and a little bit more low fat dairy product or milk, for instance, so you could try that. It will, it'll change the consistency. I'll acknowledge that it'll be thinner, it won't be as creamy, <clears throat> but that's something you could try. You could also do just a smaller portion of that soup um, in order to mitigate the overall effect of it. Regarding the tomato, um, I, you know, I think my recommendation is try to keep it less acidic, so less tomato paste if possible. And if you can get, um, it, I don't know how you're making the tomato soup, but if you're able to boil the tomatoes or cook the tomatoes down, um, for instance, if you can cook the tomatoes before you put, add, and then add maybe some of the other soup ingredients so the tomato has really been broken down, some of the acids in the tomato will cook off. So they actually volatilize and then they leave um, the food or the soup in this case. So if you can boil it, try not to be adding a lot of tomato paste and just use like a tomato product, whether that's a puree or um, canned tomatoes, or if you have them fresh, maybe more fresh tomatoes, I think those may be better than, or may be okay, again, in small portions. Um, earlier in the day and then enjoy that soup with maybe some bread so that you can sop up uh, some of that fluid and or acid. Okay. Would, yeah. Um, somebody, uh, the person who asked the question about um, GERD and the, the acidic, the non-acidic diet and, and having the consult at USD, yeah. uh, UCSD has chimed in. Um, they meant uh, all the foods on your list like citrus, tomatoes, mint, vinegar, chocolate, et cetera. No, that's interesting. Well, so that so so then I don't know if I I'm wondering if they recommended anything for reflux. Um, what other did they? In other words, did they just recommend lifestyle recommendations? Did they make any recommendations about diet whatsoever? Because it sounds like they may not share the philosophy that that we do at National Jewish. Um, and so then we just might be offering two different approaches, essentially, is what it sounds like to me. Okay. Um, is olive oil used in cooking as well as on, on salads okay to eat daily? Yes, I would argue that it's recommended, especially if you do a good extra virgin olive oil that's like a first cold press. Um, it's when you use an excessive amount such that things are really greasy. It, so what we would just try and not have the food be fried or really greasy. And if you are gonna have a greasier dish, try not to do it in a large amount just so that you can have um, more reasonable digestive time, more, more reasonable movement of that food through your digestive system. But in general, it's very healthy. Um, how do you know if restrictions work if your GERD is silent anyways? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So, uh, so 
uh, and I, um, this is something that I would encourage you to talk to your doctor about, but as Dr. Hewitt mentioned, if you didn't see her talk, there are, so there's, so in terms of metrics to determine whether or not reflux precautions are working, one is whether or not you get sick and need antibiotics, how frequently is that occurring? Has the frequency gone down? So that's one metric. Have your symptoms improved? Uh, if you're not, I'm sorry, if you're not symptomatic, then we, we uh, never mind. <laughs> but there's also radiographic um, uh, evidence. So has anything improved on your CT scan? And this is where, as a doctor, I can't speak to everything, but maybe you can see less inflammation. Um, maybe there's other evidence. Dr. Hewitt kind of talked about, um, well, she talked about the inflammation in areas of infection that can be seen. I think that's one potential metric. There may be others um, in terms of if you try the re try reflux precautions, how will you be able to see improvement? I think that's important. I just I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I do think from a frequency of, of infection and needing antibiotics perspective and some radiographic um, evidence, those would be some metrics that I know about. Um, okay, if I have silent GERD, is the 30 degree inclination still recommended? Yes, most of our okay. patients have silent GERD. Yeah, um, if you've sensed that you've aspirated some food, should you immediately use your nebulizer and maybe use it again throughout the day? Well, that's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my I, do, I don't know the answer to that. My guess is that um, you, your, your body's probably taken some of its natural mechanisms to try and clear it, like coughing. Um, in other words, you may have resolved the issue just with whatever your acute response to it was. I don't know the answer beyond that. Okay. Um, is it okay to drink lemon or orange flavored herbal tea? Because for me, it is the only thing I've found besides water that I like. Probably. That you like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, in general, I don't recommend those flavors. Um, however, having said that, um, you know, it, I, I would say if, if it's not a really strong, potent flavor and you, you get some enjoyment out of it, then I, I might be a little bit more lenient as long as you're not doing excessive fluid, maybe not doing it late um, because usually teas are fairly light. So I'm gonna, and again, because citrus is not one of maybe the more potent triggers, especially potent in terms of lowering your esophageal sphincter muscle, I might be more lenient with that. Okay. Um, uh, what recommendations do you have for somebody who has prediabetes and they've been, avoid, they've, uh, been advised to avoid carbohydrates? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I would still encourage you to include healthful carbohydrates in your diet. Um, just in moderate amounts. Um, you know, what we know really uh, hastens the progression of prediabetes to diabetes are things like sugary beverages, um, including soda or energy drinks if they're sweetened, or even 100% juice. Um, so I might be looking to say limit those things and any other very rapidly absorbed carbohydrates that you eat or drink, but keep things like oatmeal, um, keep things like brown rice, keep things like potatoes or starchy squashes, keep things like legumes, um, keep your fruits. I would keep those in your diet. I would just try and moderate the portion of them. Um, and there are other ways you can kind of help control blood sugars, including maybe being a little active after you eat those things. But in general, someone with prediabetes pre needs to avoid the sugary beverages and a lot of really rapidly absorbed carbohydrates and um, focus on eating healthful carbohydrates in moderate portions. I know that's a little general, but also focus on um, doing some just walking on a regular basis. It doesn't need to be super intense or super long, but 30 minutes, five days a week has been shown to prevent the progression of prediabetes to diabetes. And you know, it, it's a basis, it, part of the reason for that is it helps that activity, helps you use the, the sugar that's in your blood. 
So when you do have some of the blood sugar elevation after you eat carbohydrates, which is to be expected, being, rel being somewhat active during the day and doing this walking, which includes the walking, um, can help mitigate that. And I would argue that's more important than potentially including, sorry, the healthful carbohydrates in your diet is um, a way to help you maintain a healthy weight. You can still control your blood sugars with that as long as you, you don't overdo it with portions and certainly don't overdo the rapidly absorbed carbs. And I think you have to balance that, but I, I would, you know, and I would also look at what your risk for developing uh, diabetes is. I'd try and assess that as well and then balance what, which one should take priority. But in general, I think you can include healthful carbs and still manage your blood sugars. Okay. Um, what about kombucha and fermented foods? Yeah, so kombucha is, uh, it's carbonated and it's also pretty acidic um, given the, uh, uh, the ferment, the, just the fermentation process. So those would be on the limit or avoid list. Okay. What herbal teas can you recommend? Any herbal tea other than mint. So there's lots of them. And, and, and the citrus, I should include that too. Um, although as I think you heard me mention, we could be a little bit um, liberal maybe with those if those really are the only ones that you like um, for flavoring. So, you know, I do chamomile, I do um, hibiscus. There's a lot of, I like, I tend to like floral uh, herbals. Um, there's, there's other ones, so there, you can do like peach, <laughs> you can do like cinnamon apple, there's like, there's, there's a variety of different flavors um, in any of the tea section. So just try and avoid mint and um, some of the strong citrus flavors. Somebody's asking, um, is chamomile mint tea okay to drink? Oh, right. It's, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, I want to say yes, but, but you know, so chamomile mint probably is not as strong as mint, but it still has mint in it. So it's not going to be one of the preferred ones, but if you do it in small amounts and it's a light flavor, it might be okay every once in a while. Okay. During a flare up of GERD, what food or drink might help reduce symptom, symptoms? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a good question. So during a flare up, so it sounds like this person is symptomatic. Um, in terms of what foods might reduce reflux. I mean, I guess some, my, what comes to mind is potentially starchy foods that might help absorb some of the acid. Um, and then I'm trying to think, I've anecdotally people tell me that dairy seems to help. And if that's their experience, I'm okay with that. Um, other than that, I'm trying to think, I mean, making sure your, your body position is good, get upright, um, maybe try and stop eating, allow yourself to digest some. And um, I'm thinking about the starches and the dairy. I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, what is the total amount of fluid ounces we should drink daily? So, <laughs> I don't know that there, I don't, so I don't have a one size fits all answer to that. Having said that, I think most people um, will hydrate just fine with a liter to a liter and a half. That's four to six, eight ounce cups of fluid a day. And that fluid can come from all sources, both your food and your beverages. Okay. Uh, I usually have a smoothie for breakfast. Am I better off to either have porridge or muesli and cold pressed juice that I make myself? Okay. Is there a question? Sorry. Yeah. So that's, they're asking, they usually have a smoothie. Are they better off substituting oh, porridge or muesli yeah. and cold pressed juice instead? Um, I think the answer is yes, um, unless they eat something else with their smoothie, but the muesli is gonna have the oatmeal and the grains in it to maybe be absorptive. Okay. Um, does the medicine for MAC make GERD more likely? Does it change your stomach after long-term use? This yeah. person's had stomach issues since they did their treatment for MAC. Yeah, you know, I don't, 
So I don't, I don't really know. I think I'm not aware of that being the case, but I have had people tell me they end up with like gastritis um, and just a few people. So I don't have enough experience to know clinically. Um, and I'm not aware that the treatments um, adversely affect the stomach. Um, you know, I know antibiotics in general can irritate the lining of your GI tract while you're taking them. Um, and we generally, as a result, recommend probiotics to help maybe heal or help prevent that. But um, other than that, I, but it, yeah, I, 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 I'm not aware of a mechanism and I'm not aware that that's a typical side effect. Um, is Tums helpful to reduce acid reflux? Uh, Tums is an antacid. So if yes. you have symptoms of acid, then I would say yes. And it can be used intermittently um, to help with that. Okay. Um, will it help the reflux or just the acid level? It just it's just an antacid, so it doesn't affect reflux that might be coming up. It just suppresses the acid. And yeah, I think in general, we know that um, antacid medications, and I would probably I put tums in that group, can change the acidity of the reflux, but it just it makes, doesn't change, doesn't stop the reflux. Yeah. It makes it non-acid or less acid. So you All have right. less acid reflux coming up. When is the best time to exercise? Should you wait a while after eating? So if you have a lot of fluids, then yes, we want you to wait. Um, and I, I would just say if you can do it on a mostly empty stomach, or with food, if you're if you can't do empty stomach, do it with food that's really going to hold the fluid in your stomach or make it a more solid, thick mass that is less likely to slosh. Um, so I would just time the exercise with kind of the amount of liquid that's going to be in your stomach and try and minimize that or mitigate that by using starches. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions about ginger. And is it a problem for people with GERD or is it helpful? As far as I know, ginger is not an irritant. So I'm okay with ginger, just like I am okay with turmeric. Okay. Um, does non-mint chewing gum help guard against GERD? I don't think so, but I don't think it's going to make it worse. So that's a good okay. Thing. Yes. All right. Um, if I have, a, can I have some wine with an early dinner, like five to 6 p.m.? Right. Could they um, do that? So I would, so what I would say is, can you make it a small glass, um, three ounces or maybe less? And then can you stay upright for, I don't know, three to five hours and then sleep upright as well? Um, to try and help mitigate the effect that the alcohol is gonna have on your lower esophageal sphincter. Okay. Um, does walking help move food through your system and keep pressure off of the lower esophageal sphincter? Good yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could argue that it does. It's gonna help um, promote motility in your system. But if it's like a super crazy, wild, bouncy walk, <laughs> um, <laughs> If you're doing like parkour, no, but like if you're doing a lot of activity with the walk, then you're also going to be putting pressure on the system, including your lower esophageal sphincter. So, so in general, though, I think most people are walking, you know, even if it's brisk walk, it's fairly uh, level and not, not too active. So I think maybe on balance, it does. Okay. Yeah. What about green tea? Green tea is caffeinated, so it's on the limit or avoid list. Got it. Good, good point. Um, does low do, does low fat lactose is is low fat lactose free milk totally free of acid? Um, you know, I don't know what the pH of. I, I don't know, <laughs> um, but low fat milk is. Gen should generally be safe because the main problem with dairy is not the acidity, it's the, it's the fat content. Ah, okay. 
All right, well, we have answered all the questions. I would like to thank everyone for coming out today for this webinar. Oh, wait, we have one more. Okay, last one in the queue. Uh, when you say upright, do you mean standing up or does that include sitting? It can be sitting too, yeah. Okay. So that Good. your head and your, your airways are above your digestive tract and there's not pressure on your um, stomach area. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for another wonderful webinar. Everyone, thank you so much for coming out. And we hope to see you again next month for another nutrition webinar. And we hope to see you also next week for another fabulous emotional well-being webinar. Everyone have a terrific week and we'll see you soon. Thanks again, Michelle. Thanks, Amy.